in the chat box. Um, okay. So first of all, I'd like to thank you all for uh, coming to this meeting. And also I'd like to congratulate to uh, one of our fellow and one of our residents for getting their abstracts accepted in the American Thrax Society meeting that is coming up in San Francisco. Uh, Dr. Hatem Rishi and Dr. Reda Jabri uh, have their abstracts. Uh, both were presented in this meeting before. Um, one on phenylephrine versus uh, vasopressin as second line for septic shock. And the paper or the study by Dr. Reda is non-invasive ventilation patient with uh, severe acute respiratory infection. Um, both are accepted as uh, presentations and we're looking forward to see more uh, presentation from our fellows and residents uh, in international meetings. So what uh, we plan to do in series of lectures uh, is to talk about uh, certain aspects of study or research methodology. Uh, so we'll be covering today study designs in medical research. Um, and uh, this is a really important um, uh, basic understanding for all, all of us who are doing research, but uh, certainly for uh, residents and fellows and any other professional who's doing uh, mm -hmm. research uh, to understand what are the categories of research uh, designs. So it's, uh, it's probably uh, easy to uh, understand that there are two categories. Um, of re research in clinical, at least clinical research. Um, one uh, group is the observational studies and second are the experimental studies. And uh, the difference between these two is uh, how much interference we are introducing as investigators in the course of the disease. So observational studies, we have no intervention um, added to the patient or to the course of the disease. Um, while in experimental, we are introducing a therapy, a protocol, or um, or an intervention, and to see whether it has an effect or not. So we'll start with the observation studies, and observation studies have several uh, categories. So we'll talk about case series, case control studies, cross-sectional studies, and cohort studies. And it's very important to get this language right and get the type of study you are doing uh, described properly when you are proceeding with your, with designing your study and also when you are writing your uh, paper. Then experimental studies. Uh, experimental studies typically are studies that have a control group, but there are some studies without control. So we're gonna talk about this, the control trial, including parallel or concurrent control, um, usually randomized, but sometimes not randomized. We'll talk about sequential control, which includes self-control studies, crossovers, and external controls. So case series study, um, <clears throat> case series studies um, is a simple description of interesting observations in a small group of patients. So let's say that you uh, encounter the patient in the ICU. All, all viral hepatitis workup is negative. Etc. So all the known, um, all known treatment, all known causes of uh, acute liver failure um, are not there. But uh, the patient or the family gave history of exposure to a herbal medication. And then some of us may have encountered cases like this. You linked um, by um, the herbal medication with liver with acute liver failure. This single case, we call it case report. And by itself is not really research, it's an observation of one case. But let's say that there, there are second or third and fourth and fifth and multiple cases of patients with acute liver failure 
who also had recent history of exposure to this herbal medication. Um, description of these studies of these cases will be called case series, a series of cases, case series. is a simple description of interesting observation in a small group of patients. And this generally not planned before. This is, it happened, you observed it, you noticed there's a certain pattern. And it did not start with research hypothesis. It's the observation that drove some ideas that maybe this herbal medication is causing acute liver failure. And case series by definition does not include control subjects. So we don't have subjects that do not have the exposure. Um, and, there, and based on this, uh, th this report, some people consider it type of research. Sometimes people don't consider it as a study. But certainly, this type of um, description is important because it leads to a generation of a hypothesis. The next step would be to do a case control study. And case control study starts with the outcome, starts with the absence or the presence of the outcome. And from the example I gave you, the patient who has liver acute liver failure and has been exposed to um, herbal medication, let's use this terminology throughout. The liver failure here is the outcome because this is what I'm looking for what happened. And the exposure is the herbal medication. And research is really about establishing whether there is a real relationship between the exposure and the outcome. So case control studies start with the presence or absence of the outcome and then looking backwards in time to try to detect possible causes or risk factors. How does that work? So, I mean, having three or four cases of acute liver failure and these three or four cases um, had, um, her had received herbal medication could very well be a coincidence. Uh, could be that the use of herbal medication is so common in the community to the point that, yeah, some people may develop liver failure, but has nothing to do with the herbal medication. And for that reason, you would do a case control study. And the case control study in this case would be to look at all cases in your ICU that developed acute liver failure. So let's say for the year 2021 and 2020, we're gonna find all the cases which developed acute liver failure. So we are starting with the outcome. And then we're gonna go backwards, look at their history, etc., to see how many of these people have received herbal medication. We're gonna take also, th these are the cases. We're gonna take a control group. So other group, maybe from ICU patients who do not have acute liver failure. So we're gonna take control group of patients who do not have acute liver failure and go back in their history to see also if they have been exposed or had the herbal medication. And the reason for this is that we want the control group as kind of representative of the community. So maybe we can take patients who have similar age and similar sex to the patient with herbal medication. Um, and let's say that in the we found 20 patients with acute liver failure in the last two years, and 50% have received the herbal medication. And in the control group, we took another 20, let's say, and also among the 20, half of them, 50%, have received the herbal medication. What does that tell me? That tells me that the herbal medication use is really not different between those who had liver failure and those who did not, so unlikely to be related. But if in the patients who have herbal of the liver failure, 50% have 
herbal, medica herbal medication history, and in the control group, 0%, then it appears to be the association, there appears to be association between the two. So case control, case and control. Cases are the cases of the individuals with the disease or the outcome, who are starting with the outcome. And the controls are individuals without the disease or the outcome. We are asking in this type of study, what happened? What happened? I know the patient already had liver failure. What happened for him to have had liver failure? Did he receive a herbal medication? Did he receive acetaminophen, et cetera? And so they are by nature retrospective studies. They are longitudinal because I'm looking backwards in time and inquiring covering a period of time. Usually they match by age and sex characteristics. Graphically shown in the slide, cases are those with liver failure. So I identify patients with the cases. We identify a group of people control who do not have the disease. And then look, look at their history to find the exposure to find how many patients had exposed to herbal medication. We can look at multiple exposures. We can look at whether they have acetaminophen, whether they have uh, oral contraceptive, whatever. I mean, medication, certain drugs, et cetera. We can look at multiple exposures. One of the advantage of case control, you can have only one outcome, but you can look at multiple exposures. What you could see here is that the onset of the study is when the, is that you already have the outcome. You are going backwards in the inquiry in time or asking what happened, what happened. So certain advantages of case control study include that the outcome already exists. So it is easy, relatively easier study to do because the outcome already there um, and the information probably all in medical records. Um, the one of the disadvantages, I mean, there are, there are several disadvantages of this. Uh, one of them is that sometimes details about the exposure may not be available in medical records. But another, the biggest disadvantage of case control study is that the selection of the control could be sometimes biased, could be problematic um, because you are the one who are selecting the control group. Nevertheless, case control studies can be very useful in identifying risk factors. So for example, identifying risk factors who will have developed MERS infection, for example, was identified in a very well-designed case control study, looking at those who developed MERS a control group who did not have MERS, same age and sex, and they looked at, for example, exposure to camel, owning camels, et cetera, social, social economic status, and compared the two and came up with some very important findings. The third type in observational study is cross-sectional study. And cross-sectional study, as the name implies, analyze data collected at one time rather than over time. It's cross section, it's crossing, it's like one time. You're asking what is happening now, not what happened like in the other study, what is happening now. They focus on one point of time, they are called prevalence studies. So example for this, what's the prevalence of MRSA in our ICUs today? So you know, very often they do um, um, point prevalence study. So at one point, so on, on January 20, 2022, we're gonna see how many patients are in the ICUs and how many of them have MRSA. So this is a prevalence cross-sectional study. Example also of cross-sectional studies are surveys on polls. So if you send a survey about opinion for certain things, 
um, this is reflect the, op the opinion at that time. So it is cross-sectional study. So cross-sectional study is subjects or selected for the study. And we're looking at the outcome at that point. There is really the, the answer of the study and the time is done at the same time. There is no direction or inquiry of the inquiries. So our question here, what is happening? One advantage of the study is that relatively easy to do, relatively. Uh, you can include large number of subjects because it's easy. So you could look at many, many patients on one day and how many of them have per MRSA. Um, some disadvantages, obviously, it doesn't necessarily tells you that the, uh, the causal relationship doesn't tell you that it, the MRSA because you were in the ICU or they, you are in the ICU because of the MRSA, because you are looking at the, them at the same time. So it doesn't tell you MRSA came first, ICU admission came first or not. It doesn't tell you this information. The fourth type of um, observation study is the cohort studies and cohort meaning a group. So cohort is a group of people who have something in common. And cohort study means that we take this cohort or group of people who have something in common and follow them over time. So we start, about, we ask about what will happen. They are typically prospective studies. So unlike the case control studies here, we are starting with the exposures and we look forward to the outcomes. So case control cohort study is a group of people who have something in common. And then some have the exposure, some don't have the exposure. And we look forward to their outcomes. The best classic um, study that looked the cohort study is the Framingham study which looked at cardiovascular risk factors in the 1948 in a city, small city called Framingham in the USA. It's a small town that has 6,000 people. These people were a cohort. So they were followed over time for years and years to see how many, who will develop myocardial infarction. And at the beginning of the study, the subject information was, was documented whether they have diabetes, whether they have high cholesterol, whether they have hypertension, and whether they were smoking, for example. And over time, they looked at whether they developed myocardial infarction. And by doing this, they were able to identify the risk factors that we now know for, cardio, for, for myocardial infarction, that's smoking, diabetes, hypertension, um, are associated um, diabetes and hypertension and smoking uh, uh, and, and high cholesterol are associated with increased risk of myocardial infarction. This is because of this cohort study. This cohort study was continued for years, for decades actually, on the children or second generation and third generation to see the risk factors even from based on family history for myocardial infarction and stroke. There are many examples of core studies in the literature that helped us a lot understanding risk factor for cancer, woman health, et cetera. All these are cohort studies. Cohort studies typically um, are prospective studies. They look for risk factors. The example I gave you, risk factors for MI, a risk factor for for a breast cancer, risk factors for lung cancer. But also they are useful in the ICU, for example, for outcome assessment. So a court study on patients with COVID is taking a group of people who have COVID and looking uh, forward to see what happened to them, how many of them developed organ failure, how many of them survive, how many get intubated, how many get extubated, 
Uh, so this is outcome assessment. Sometimes court studies, we do it retrospectively or historically, but historically, the direction of inquiry remains forward. So we still look at the group of people who have something in common, but instead of following these patients prospectively, we follow them through medical records. So typical court study, the one like Framingham, is you take people, bring them to clinic, do their baseline diabetes, hypertension, and then follow a visit after six months and, and after a year, et cetera. It's very resource intensive um, and um, very costly, requires lots of time. They are very strong studies, very important studies, but sometimes they are hard to do, especially for uncommon conditions. So let's think about, so myocardial infarction, unfortunately, is relatively common. So if you take 6,000 people in five years, some patients will have myocardial infarction because it's relatively common. But if you are looking at, for, for example, at the risk factors for rare congenital heart disease, then if you take 6,000 people and follow them after five years, you may not find any case and then it will be just completely waste. It will not work. In that case, maybe you're better off doing a historical course study, a retrospective course study, where you look at thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of medical records and look forward if they, for these patients if they're, the babies developed, uh, my car, developed uh, congenital heart disease. So historical course study, um, very similar to the co prospective or uh, typical court study. You are taking a group of people and follow them over time. But this case, we're not looking at people, we're looking at records and follow people throughout their record over time to see if they develop the outcome. So the answer study, instead of being here, the answer study is actually be, is here when the outcome has happened. But we are, unlike the case control study, we're still looking direction of inquiry is from the exposure to the outcome. So let me summarize here. It's very important to uh, pause here a little bit. So case control studies start with the outcome and goes back to the exposure. Cohort study start with the exposure and follow patients to see if they develop the outcome. It's very important distinction here. The core study typically will require much larger sample size because obviously if you take thousands of people, maybe only few will develop the outcome. In the case control study, the patients identify they have the outcome already. So you need fewer patients generally. This is a representation of the difference between the two case control study. We start with the cases. We start with the cases and we start with the outcomes, and then we'll go back to the exposure. In the core study, we start with the exposure and we look for the outcome. The direction of inquiry in case control study is backwards, what happened? In a core study, what will happen? The direction of inquiry is forward. So a few comparisons, generally speaking, well-designed court study has more weight in establishing cause than the results from case control study. Um, and part of this because there are many biasing factors, there are many biases that can affect the case control study. Um, I gave you the example of the liver failure. So if I take 20 patients who have developed liver failure in my ICU, and then I take a control from my unit, it is possible, in my unit that I have uh, a trauma unit, I may end up with many trauma patients in that control group. Another unit may have more cancer, for example, et cetera. Um, so these are factors that as part of the design, can't do much about it, but you need to be aware of these um, biasing factors. The case control studies have an advantage of being able to be done over a short period of time they are less expensive while court studies require longer time because you need the follow-up. 
they are resource intensive. Generally, case control studies are useful for rare diseases. And case control studies um, can set the stage for cohort studies. Let's move on to the next category, which is the experimental studies. So the, by definition, experimental studies are those where we are introducing an intervention, could be a treatment, could be a procedure, could be a protocol, um, and then seeing whether we made an impact. Um, this could be animal studies or human studies, which will be the subject of the rest of this talk. And human studies that are experimental are called clinical trials. Um, they can be controlled or uncontrolled, and the control can be placebo or conventional procedure. The control, meaning the comparison group, could be comparison group at the same time, so parallel or concurrent, or could be sequential, um, meaning the interval, we'll ex explain this in a minute, the, uh, the intervention and the control group are not the same time, could be external control, and sometimes we don't, some studies do not have control. So trials with concurrent control, meaning that we have two groups of patients. One group is the experimental group where we give this group of patients the intervention or the medication that we are studying or the procedure that we are studying. And we have another group, control group, in which given same treatment, except for the investigational intervention, which we are not giving here. So one, we are giving the intervention, so the interventional under investigation, and the other one we are not giving. And by doing this, because they are treated everything otherwise the same, we are hoping that the difference in outcome between this group would be related, or assuming that the difference in outcome would be related to the intervention we are delivering. So any difference in the, between the two groups will be attributed to the experimental intervention. So control group could be sometimes no treatment, no treatment meaning no, no intervention, no experimental intervention control. So we, we could be um, uh, taking two groups of patients or randomizing patients one group to receive the intervention and the other one just to start the usual care. No, no, uh, no intervention, no intervention. One taking a medication and the other one not receiving the medication. The drawback for this is we cannot exclude the possibility of the effect is not related to the property of the intervention, but to the placebo effect. So uh, humans, if we take a placebo, if you give people a medication that is really inactive pharmacologically, you may get some changes. Could be psychological or I don't know, physiological, but it, some changes might be related just to taking the medication. So um, that's an issue in some studies, maybe not very important issues in other studies. So that will be an, uh, a problem with no treatment. So better to give us some type of placebo especially for medications. So a medication, um, this is easy for medications, difficult for procedures. For the placebo, so patient will get, uh, a group will get the active drug and the other one will give similar drug, but inactive. Sometimes we give the conventional therapy. So for example, example of this is, let's say the standard of care for community acquired pneumonia is ceftriaxone and azithromycin. That's the standard of care. And now there's a new antibiotic that has been developed that appears to be in the lab superior to this medication. So the way we study it is we, our question would be, is this better than the standard care? So in that, uh, in that case, we'll randomize patients to receive either the standard care, which is ceftriaxone and azithromycin or the new, and the new drug. But we don't do it 
against placebo because it doesn't is, is not not the right thing to do. Not giving any treatment for a patient with pneumonia will be not acceptable. How we assign study subjects to, to be in this group or the other, that's another very important issue. So if I have a experimental drug and a placebo, theoretically, I could give I get a patient, I give him this drug or this drug, I decide which one I give. And it's not randomized. Not randomization be, will be a big problem. If I decide which one we'll get or the investigator decides, then the decision is influenced by his choices. He may choose sicker patient to receive drug A or B based on whatever reasons. And then you'll end up with two groups that are not similar. So it could be one group generally older, another group sicker, et cetera. And then when you have difference in outcome, you will never be able to tell whether this is related to the group being sicker or older, or it's related to the treatment you gave. So this will not be a really good option. A better, much better option is to do randomization. So it's by chance patients will be allocated to receive A or B. And by randomization ensures that the two groups are equal in their characteristics. So I end up with two groups that are similar in their characteristics. And what I, at the end, when I look at the outcomes, the only difference between the two groups is that one received treatment A and one received treat, uh, treatment B. So if there is difference in outcome, it would be related to the uh, treatment differences, not to differences in allocation. Another aspect to strengthen the design of randomized controlled trial is double blinding. And double blinding, um, meaning that the investigator doesn't know whether the patient assigned to A or B, or the patient knows whether he is getting A or B. And that's important in many studies, especially pharmacologic study, because if I'm giving drug A, and I know drug A is, for example, has some nephrotoxicity, um, and I'm aware of what treatment I'm giving, I may pay more attention to the kidneys and avoid nephrotoxic drugs or give more fluid or diuretics or differently than the other group, then this will really skew the whole study design because one group then is getting treatment A, but also getting some other different things as well, different from the second group. Double blinding means that I don't know what the patient is getting. So that will not influence my co-interventions to these two groups. This slide summarizes what, how randomized control trial works. So we take subjects who meet the inclusion criteria. Randomization works here. We randomize patients to be in this group or in this group. And then double blinding works here in the delivering the intervention. After patients are allocated, we give them the intervention in a double-blinded fashion, and then we look at their outcomes. And many studies will include blinding of the outcome assessment, especially if the outcome has some subjectivity. I mean, if the outcome is mortality, you don't need necessarily to be blinded because it's, I mean, my, chance of making mistakes in this or making bias is very, very low. But certain outcomes can be subjective. For example, let's say interpretation of X-ray or measurement of blood pressure or um, assessment of quality of life. These can be subjective. So it is much better that the one who's assessing the outcome is blinded, so he doesn't know whether the patient got treatment, got intervention, or the control group. 
as you could see, uh, obviously, randomized control trial is prospective. By definition, it cannot be retrospective ever. So its direction of the study is this way. Is blinding always possible? Um, no. Uh, sometimes we do single blinding. And um, sometimes you cannot do blinding at all. An example of this would be um, um, if you are testing surgery, for example, surgery versus or two, two type of surgical procedures, or you are testing surgery versus radiation therapy for cancer. It will be almost nearly impossible to uh, blind the patient to the surgery or blind him to the radiation therapy. Patient has to know because, I mean, it's a big, big deal. If you are doing laparoscopic versus uh, laparoscopic versus open uh, cholecystectomy, for example, blinding of the surgeon will be impossible. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And uh, even the, the patient, mm, yeah, plus or minus, but it will be really also hard. But what you could do is you could still measure the outcomes in a blinded fashion. So blinding, it's possible in typically in uh, drug uh, studies, although not always, but it's it's uh, it's it's a common uh, commonly used. But in some studies, it will be not um, possible. For example, we did the helmet trial. You are comparing helmet versus uh, mask non-invasive ventilation. It is impossible to blind the um, treating team for helmet. I mean, they, because they have to manage the helmet and or the patient, because I mean, he just he has to have it. So blinding in this case is just not, not possible. So randomized control trials are the, really the epitome of all uh, study research. It's, uh, it's, it's a high, provide the highest evidence for concluding causation because really it isolates the exposure. You, by randomization, every, all the characteristics are expected to be similar in the two groups. The only difference in the two groups will be one group getting the intervention and one getting the control. So whatever happened to the outcome will be linked to this difference between <clears throat> the intervention and the control group. It provides the best assurance that the results are due to the intervention. There's another schematic uh, representation of randomized control trial, patient meeting inclusion criteria, randomized to experimental group, and you monitor them over time for whether they have the outcome or not. The control group also, you monitor them. The intervention is received here. The onset of the study is when we enroll patients and you monitor patients over time. Sometimes people present or report concurrent uh, control that are not randomized. For example, I could be reporting the results of doing percutaneous tracheostomy in COVID patients. In, in this, I mean, you could plan a study where you do um, percutaneous tracheostomy or ECMO, for example, in uh, COVID patients. And you compare it to non um, to patients who are not treated with this modality, with tracheostomy, or with, with, for example, surgical tracheostomy, or no ECMO, but in an unrandomized fashion. It could provide some information, but it is, I have to tell you, it has many sources of bias that makes the conclusion highly questionable. The reason for this is that the decision to do percutaneous tracheostomy versus surgical tracheostomy is not random. Um, we select patients who get for percutaneous tracheostomy. We select them because they typically, maybe anatomy is better, maybe less risk, while surgical tracheostomy maybe they were a little more difficult anatomically, etc. So the two groups, 
are not same. So if you look at the outcome at the end, whether it's a complication or what happened to the patient, you cannot just say this is related to the procedure. This may be related also to the factors that make you select the patient. So the indication bias, in other words. So, uh, so the conclusion from this will be much weaker because you cannot do much to prevent bias in patient assignment. Sometimes we do some statistical analysis and multivariate and, and uh, that and this, and we'll do propensity scores and da, 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 all these, but they, they all, these type of statistical adjustments, they don't really fully account for the differences between the two populations, no matter what you think. So it is very possible that we select the stronger patients. I mean, this would be normally what we do as clinicians for certain treatments. Maybe you select for, you probably will select for ECMO, the patients who are more likely to survive. The ones who are poor prognosis, maybe you will not select them. So the when you compare the two groups, you end up with two groups that are not similar. This explains why many observational studies may have shown positive, suggested positive effect of certain treatments, but when randomized to control trials were done, then this all did not show, did disappear because the difference that was seen observation study was probably related to confounders, related to patient assignment. Other type of study will be self-control. So in this case, we take patients, use their patient as their own control. So if you wanna test whether a certain drug lower blood pressure, you could take a group of patients and monitor their blood pressure over a certain time and then you introduce the drug, and then you measure the blood pressure after you introduce the drug. So in this case, you compare patients before and after the drug, and each patient is kind of cell is helping as his own control. One issue with this type of study is if you take, let's take a, in the community, we take a group of people, um, who are hypertensive and we want to test a new drug for hypertension <clears throat> and we take these subjects and we monitor their blood pressure every day um, and to your blood pressure is 160 and next day 150 etc your blood pressure etc your blood pressure is high then after one month we introduce a drug and measure the blood pressure we may encounter something called Hawthorne effect or we are likely to actually encounter an effect called Hawthorne effect, where people, because they are monitored, um, they may change their behavior. So if you have somebody and you tell him every day that your blood pressure, he knows every day that he's monitoring his blood pressure and the blood pressure is high, he may start to avoid taking, eating salty food, may start to do some exercise, maybe start, stop smoking, et cetera. And then with time, blood pressure start to decline. So after you introduce the drug, the second month, the blood pressure will be lower than the first month, not necessarily only because of the drug, but also because the patient has changed his behavior. This is called Hawthorne effect. We all change behavior if we are observed. It's also called learning effect. So what we could do about this is we do something called crossover study. So that's a, another type of study. So instead of taking this group of people and monitor them over time without the blood pressure medication and then introduce the blood pressure medication, what we could do now is split them into two halves the first half will, will do this, what I mentioned, just monitor them after one month, introduce the drug and then measure blood pressure after the drug. But the second group, you do the opposite. You give them the drug first, 
in the first month, then you stop it in the second month. It's called crossover study. So we take a group of people, we give them the experimental. So half of them will start with the experimental intervention and we look at the outcomes, for example, here, blood pressure. Then we swap them to the other group. So change them to the other, no drug, for example, and see the outcome. And the second half of the group will be the control. So the first month will not be receiving the drug. And then the second month will receive the drug and see their blood pressure. And by doing this, we end up with really multiple comparisons. We can compare this to this, this to this, this to this, and this, this to this, multiple comparisons. And we could, hopefully and will be easily able to tell whether the drug is what's making difference or it is the Hawthorne effect or time that is making difference. So if, if, the, if the effect is related to time, you like to see it more both groups in the second half. If it's related to the drug, you see it with the, associated with the drug. It's a nice, um, design in ICU study is not common because it would require outcomes that are reversible. So blood pressure, um, you stop the drug, it goes up or goes down, whatever. So it's, it's reversible. But if you are looking at outcomes such as mortality or survival or recovery, this design doesn't work. It's, it's not, a, not the right design. But certainly it's a good design. It will need <clears throat> smaller number of patients generally. <clears throat> Sometimes there are interventions that are really hard to study. Um, so take, for example, um, certain procedures that did not exist in the past and now they exist and they become standard of care. Let's take a group of people who have severe kyphoscoliosis and um, you want to see whether doing corrective surgery would now become standard of care, improves their outcome, improves their respiratory function and survival. Um, so you take these subjects and look at their survival, but it's really hard to take a patient now with kyphoscoliosis very bad and tell him you're gonna be in the control group, you're gonna monitor for the next 10 years to see if you, what's your survival looks like without treatment. Well, this will be considered unethical. And in that case, what we could do is go back to medical records and find 20 years ago when the surgery was not available, what happened to these similar patients who were and not received, did not receive such therapy. We could also go to other hospitals where this therapy or other centers or other places where this therapy is not available and compare the outcome of similar patients. And certainly you will get some information, but I think it's very obvious probably to all of you that you're gonna encounter problems in the study because um, there will be significant confounders. So for example, if you compare the outcomes of patients treated currently for kyphoscoliosis versus the one treated in the 80s was kyphoscoliosis, the difference of outcome, you're gonna see a huge difference in outcome, but may not be related only to the surgery, but relate to the improvement in general medical care you probably have better vaccinations, better antibiotic, better uh, general medical care, et cetera, better non-invasive ventilation. So the outcome will be different, not necessarily only because of surgery, but to many other confounding factors. Lastly, uncontrolled studies for interventions are do exist and people introduce certain interventions, certain therapy, 
um, very often with procedures, and then they describe their outcomes. They are similar to cohort study, but they are really for an intervention. And the major problem with this is that the investigator assumed that the procedure used is the best one. Without control, you cannot prove this ever. And the problem with this is that um, people introduce certain procedures and publicize it. And if it becomes really public, um, then these unproven procedures start to become the standard of care. And it becomes really difficult later for researchers to undertake subsequent controlled studies. Example of this, uh, actually what happened initially in the COVID-19 pandemic with the chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, when people start to publish small series of, we gave hydroxychloroquine to 50 patients and all of them survived and da, 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 and that. And it made it hard for some many places even to con randomized control trial because everybody <clears throat> was pushing to give hydroxychloroquine to everybody, everyone. And you tell them, I'm gonna give you placebo becomes a difficult task. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of clinical trials? Clinical trials, especially randomized control trial is a gold standard or reference in medicine. It is the basic design against all designs are judged because it provides the greatest justification for concluding causality. And double blind studies are the best, obviously, if possible. Randomized control trials are not easy. They are costly. They require a long time. And they can be difficult with commonly used therapies. I give you the example, a hydroxychloroquine example. Um, years ago, Swan Gans, research was difficult because everybody wants to put swan guns, etc. So when commonly used therapies, people are so um, fixed on certain treatment becomes harder to, um, um, to test in a clinical trial. So with this, I'll stop and open the floor for question. I don't know if the chat box exists. I don't see it. Um, but people can raise hands and will un um unmute okay dr hani let me see unmute can you unmute yourself yeah uh, yes prof yes yeah. i'll take a laugh yeah wallahi very much enjoyable or very much appreciated just a quick comment about the uh, rcts since they are uh, relatively expensive and in the icu settings there's a challenge of recruiting enough number of patients from a single center so just one comment for our future colleagues uh, researchers about when running uh, multi center trials especially with the strict protocols of the study so that facilitates uh, their project. So this is just a comment I, I would uh, like to share, dear Prof. Thank you very much, Hakim. Thank you very much, Dr. Hani. I fully agree. I think the randomized control trials need to be, have to have, to have a sufficient uh, sample size and, and power to be able to address the question. And therefore, it is very important to uh, have multi-center studies and we uh, need to, I mean, help and collaborate to be able to achieve um, sufficient sample size. Next is Fatma Daoud. Let me see if I can unmute. Yeah, unmute. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Arabi, for the informative uh, presentation. Uh, my question is, can we combine the longitudinal studies with the randomized controlled trials? And if yes, uh, what would be the best way to follow up with the participants? The data from randomized control, randomized control trials, um, once you do randomized control trials, essentially you have a um, data almost like a cohort study um, because you are collecting data on patients prospectively and follow them over time. And very often we use the data 
from uh, randomized control trials to inform other study questions. So the data from randomized control trials can be used to address um, uh, additional questions as a cohort study. So how, how are we going to follow up with those because they are randomized? Well, you have to have it in the protocol, obviously. So uh, patients who are randomized, randomization, typically, I mean, for ICU patients, at least, we follow them for a certain period of time, let's say 90 days, 180 days, one year, whatever. In cancer studies, it will be multiple years uh, follow-ups, even randomized controlled trials. So you have enough follow-up. If you're planning to have a longer follow-up, this can be in the protocol. There's no problem. You can have it part of the... Uh, study protocol that we'd like to follow up patients. So for example, the we are doing the helmet trial mm -hmm. where we are randomizing patients to uh, helmet versus um, mask and IV. And the primary outcome is 28 days, but we have also a follow-up at 180 days. Many studies in cardiac arrest or infection looks at the outcome on 80 days, one year, sometimes two years. Neurologic studies look at studies uh, typically six months, but you could extend it if you if you wish to do so. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dr. Shogi. Shogi, I don't know if I'm able to unmute you or not. Mm. Can you unmute yourself? Uh, hello? Yes, yes, go ahead. Thank you, Professor Yassin, for this informative uh, presentation. Uh, my question is that uh, the case report study is uh, under which uh, category of those study you mentioned? The case control. <laughs> Case control. Case control is observation study. <clears throat> case report or case control. Case report is is one step before case control. It's a single case. Case control. Case series is multiple cases. Case control is multiple cases, but also you have control group. Okay, other questions? If you have any questions, raise hands. Okay, very good. Um, so, Ms. Iman. Yes, Prof. Yassin, thank you for the wonderful lecture. I missed uh, the initial part of it. Uh, I mean, uh, your tool to measure the case control study is the odds ratio. And when it is less than one, it's uh, not sick. I mean, it's protective. And if it's more than one, it's uh, risk. And it's if, if, if it equals, I mean, one, then it's not significant. And your tool for case control, uh, this cohort study is the relative risk. The, how okay. you measure the effectiveness <clears throat> of, uh, of your study, of this observational study. Mm -hmm. Likewise, for your uh, interventional study, you have this number needed to treat and absolute risk reduction, I think, which is yeah. more important. Good, well, good question. So this, what we call this measures of association, there are different ways to express the association between um, exposure and outcome. As I said, we are, all the study design that I described is really about describing whether there is association between the exposure and outcome. And the way to express it is by what's called measures of association. You mentioned several of them. 
you mentioned the relative risk or um, uh, also odds ratios, but there are others, hazard ratio, etc. All these numbers gives you association. I think we need to be a little um, careful about saying protective or not protective because this is another concept. Protection means causality. So um, if I take back to the example that I gave about the herbal medication and liver, liver failure. So if the, um, if the uh, relative risk is like three or four, it's high, it's more than one, and the confidence interval does not cross one, so it is statistically associated with um, the herbal medication, but it doesn't mean that it is the cause. It is association. Associate, there is difference between causality and association. Observational studies can only prove association. To prove causality, there are certain criteria. And among all the designs I I described today, the only one that confidently give you information about causality is randomized control trials. Um, so the other, other point is the association above one or below one being positive or negative. It depends on the outcome, obviously. So if the outcome is mortality, then more than one is bad. But if the outcome is survival, more than one is good. So, so I, not, I don't think we should. So we need to look at what's the outcome. Does that answer your question? Yes. I mean, uh, at, I mean, this case control study, still they are, they, they, you can have some link for causality, then you can set up your randomized control trials, but it will give you an idea. Yeah, it will give you a suggestion of association, but the yeah, causality, like there are, causality, there are other criteria. It can be, but there are multiple other criteria to be met. I mean, they are still better than cross-sectional or other descriptive studies. Uh, yeah, in certain conditions, yes. Thank you. But cohort will be better. Cohort studies will be better. Yes, of course. It's uh, the hierarchy. It's higher, of course. Yeah. Sounds good. Good comments. Any other questions? If not, uh, I'd like to thank you all. I think we plan to do a few other similar talks uh, in the coming uh, few months. We will send the schedule around. Um, you have raised hands by Fatima again, or it's an old uh, raised hand? Yes, uh, I have uh, another question. You mentioned that uh, RCTA can establish causation and other types of study with the, with the measures you mentioned and Ms. Iman, that they can, uh, uh, the measures to establish association. So when do we say there is correlation? Which measure we are going to use? Correlation is different uh, thing. Uh -huh. uh, correlation is more like statistical term. Uh, uh, it is a, as, as a correlation is a form of associate between two uh, continuous variables. So I think that for for co <clears throat> for um, for exposure and outcome, we use typically the the uh, the term association. Correlation, for example, um, uh, let's say risk of cancer and smoking. Um, how many packs you smoke? Two packs, three packs, four packs, and risk is percentage. This will be correlation. You plot them, you plot X and Y. This is a correlation. So correlation is more statistical term. But I would use to describe the relation between exposure and outcome as associated. Herbal medication is associated with, um, with liver failure, not correlated. Correlated um, would be number of cigarettes smoked per day is a cor correlate with the risk, the 10 year risk of lung cancer. Uh, 
that will be correlation because if you plot them on X and Y a graph, they will correlate. So that's called Pearson correlation. It's a more statistical term. Very good. Well, thank you all for uh, attending the meeting today and we'll hope to see you again in the next uh, meeting. Have a good night.